Landing coupler disengaged. Restrict speed until clear of the station perimeter.
shift charge detected. Target shields offline. Target destroyed. destroyed. detected. Shift drive charging. Four, three, two, one, engage.
Fringe. Shift drive charging. Four, three, two, one, engage. Frame shift drive charging. Four, three, two, one, engage. Shift drive charging. Four, three, two, one, engage. Docking request granted. There's another bio waste village on deck C. Sanitation team response.
Cargo scoop deployed. Cargo scoop retracted. Landing gear deployed. Successful. Engines disengaged. East. Engines engaged. Landing gear retracted. Frameshift drive charging. Ready to engage. Shift drive charging. Shift drive charging.
Dynamics, Bravo, Romeo, Oscar, Federal Flight Control welcomes you. Please submit a docking request before entering the station. Request approved. You are clear for approach to pad 3-8. Incoming message.
Raxler, to the jewel that burns on the brow of the mother of galaxies, to the whisperer in witch space, the siren of the deepest void, the parent's grief, the lover's woe, and the yearning of our vagabond hearts. To Raxler! Alleged Toast of the Dark Wheel The legend of Raxler has been circulating in whispers for centuries. The quest for this mysterious place, the location of which is a deadly secret, was said to be the principal aim of the Dark Wheel, a putative fraternity of legend chasers from the early days of interstellar travel. The earliest recorded mention of Raxler dates from 2296, from the Journal of Art Torngvist, a shipboard mechanic based in the Tau Ceti system. He writes, Cora comes home, soused and raving with wild stories, a new one every night. She claims she's found a map to some pirate stash, and all I have to do is loan her my ship so we can go dig it up. Hmm, maybe we should go find Raxler while we're at it. Although Tongvis's account is the first known attestation of Raxler, it is clear from context that the myth was already in circulation. It is extremely difficult to find consistency among the various fragmentary rumors of Raxler, much like the ancient myths of Atlantis, El Dorado, and the kingdom of Prester John. Interpretations of the story range from the skeptical to the outlandish. Raxler has been suggested to be anything from an unremarkable moon to a state of cosmic enlightenment. The earliest documented stories tend to agree on several points, however, that Raxler is a definite place, and that it holds a mystical secret. Several versions of the Raxler story mention an alien artifact, the Omphalus Rift, described as a gateway or tunnel through which parallel universes can be accessed. These details, however, were later shown to bear a striking resemblance to the children's story, Princess Astrophel and the Spiraling Stars, and soon lost credibility. Undaunted, some Raxler seekers insisted that the story's author had cunningly concealed facts about the mysterious locale in his book, as hints for those with eyes to see. Students of Raxler lore have noted that the legend exerts a strangely potent fascination. Landing gear retracted. Landing coupler disengaged. Follow the greens on your way out. On the minds of seekers. Commentators have compared this sensation to Fernway the uncountable longing for a place one has never seen. More than one interstellar treasure seeker has become obsessed with Raxler to the exclusion of all other dreams and spent his or her entire life in a futile search for it. Raxler also plays a role in several conspiracy theories, most of which attest that it has already been discovered by some kind of sinister cabal or salt tyrant, which has leveraged its power to establish covert dominance over humanity. Whatever the truth of the matter, one thing remains irrefutable. The legend of Rexler continues to inspire explorers and conspiracy theorists to this day. Charging. The Dark Wheel. Oh, they're out there all right. I've never met them, but I know they're out there. Think about how well known the stories are. Now think about... Four, three, two, one, engage. How easy it would be for some two-bit band of hucksters to pass themselves off as the Dark Wheel and start trading on their reputation. Doesn't happen does it? Not for long, anyway. Whenever someone tries to usurp the Dark Wheel name, sooner or later they get quietly shut down. And that's how I know. Felicity Farseer, Explorer. The Dark Wheel is the name given to a legendary group of adventurers, explorers, 
investigators and treasure hunters. The existence frameshift drive charging, which is so lacking in cooperative evidence that it is generally considered a myth. The group is often mentioned in connection with the equally unsubstantiated Raxler. Those who believe. Four, three, two, one. In the existence of the Dark Wheel, consider it to be a continuous and clandestine organization, operating since the very earliest days of interstellar travel. According to the law, only a handful of the bravest and most competent pilots of each generation are honored with an invitation to join the group. It is a futile attempt to contact the Dark Wheel on one's own initiative. However, it is always they who initiate contact. Initially in the frameshift drive charging skies, revealing their true identity, only once a suitable test of courage and skill has been discreetly administered and passed. Opposing theories assert that new members are selected. Four, three, two, one, engage. On the basis of lineage, with existing members covertly training their children and revealing the fact of their membership only when the child is ready. Conversely, some members are believed to go to great lengths to prevent their children from ever becoming involved, since the group's secrets are dangerous. According to the self-professed Dark Wheel expert, Lita Crane, a conspiracy theorist and people's journalist who has painstakingly assembled an archive of relevant data, the original group was based in a disused starport orbiting the eighth moon of an unnamed gas giant. The station was a toroid, hence wheel, and operated with a minimal power output so as to avoid detection, hence dark. Crane believes that this starport is still in use and is the only means whereby the genuine dark wheel can verify its identity. New inductees can examine the records and artifacts preserved there and thus satisfy themselves that the group has indeed been operating for centuries. No such starport has ever been found, however, and rival experts have accused Crane of forging her evidence in order to maintain the revenue from her billions of followers. Over the years, many people have claimed to be members of the Dark Wheel, to have identified some or all of the group's members, or to have discovered the group's location. But the contradictory nature of these claims suggests that most of them, if not all, are untrue. In 3300, a group identifying itself as the Dark Wheel emerged in the Shinrata Desra system, which is not accessible to pilots of lower than elite rank. It is not apparent if the group is a legitimate descendant of the original Dark Wheel, a reconstruction, or merely an opportunistic imitator. Colonia. We were in a tight spot and people came through for us without even being asked. That's what people do. <laughs> Didn't hurt that the whole idea was flat out crazy, of course. That just made them more determined. Jacques, owner of Jacques Station. Colonia lies some 22,000 light years from the core systems and was the first system in the Colonia Nebula to be settled by humanity. The circumstances of Colonia's founding are highly unusual the system was colonized as a result of the spontaneous actions of independent pilots, rather than through a formal expansion program. The colonization of Colonia began with an accident involving Jacques Station, a jump-capable orbit starport. In May 3302, the station executed a long-distance jump to Beacon Point, but when it failed to reach its destination, Khan, Bravo, Romeo, Oscar. It's a pleasure to have you at this Federal Station, Commander. Access Nation. granted. It was you are go lost. for approach to pad In June 3302, an independent pilot discovered Jack Station in the E.L. Pru RST D394 system, suffering from technical issues and effectively stranded. The galactic community reacted swiftly, launching an independent supply drive to restore the starport to functionality. The relief effort soon exceeded its original objective, and many of those involved began to see the distant system as a chance to establish a new community, far from the wearisome conflicts and entrenched viewpoints of the core systems. 
tool. Landing gear deployed. Look of a permanent colony went from light-hearted speculation to serious planning. In September 3302, EL-PRU RST D394 was formally renamed Colonia, and the first permanent settlement was constructed on the surface of Colonia 2A. An influx of migrants boosted the system's population, aided financially by the Colonia Council, the region's new governing body, and materially by independent pilots. Colonia is widely viewed as a monument to community spirit and human ingenuity, as well as being the first step into a previously uninhabited region of space. Landing sequence completed. Ground crew have been dispatched. Colonia's population is still small, but the region is undergoing continuous expansion and attracting attention from both enterprising corporations and optimistic migrants. To date, Colonia has remained untroubled by the strife that often plagues the core systems, earning it a reputation as a sanctuary. But it remains to be seen if this nascent community will thrive in isolation or be engulfed by political and corporate forces. The Thargoids. Human Thargoid contact. The Thargoids are a non-human race with a history of hostility towards humanity. The first recorded encounter with a Thargoid ship took place in 2849, although earlier undocumented encounters are believed to have taken place. In the years that followed, contact with lone Thargoid vessels was intermittently reported. Humanity clashed with the Thargoids in the 32nd century. But details of the conflict remained scarce for many years, and it proved difficult to differentiate authentic accounts of Thargoid encounters from the sensationalist media stories of the time. The discovery of abandoned intergalactic naval reserve arm bases in 30 Frameshift drive charging. 303 did much to dispel the... 4, 3, 2, 1, engage. Fog, however. The INRA a joint federal imperial initiative established in 3193 was responsible for researching the Thargoids and developing technologies to counter their aggression. But the organization's lack of accountability meant that the details of its research did not come to light until years after its dissolution. Almost all of the reliable data concerning the Thargoids has been sourced from INRA facilities. This data, originally deemed highly confidential, was declassified in 3304, following a resolution from the federal government and an imperial decree. Some controversy over the backing and funding of the INRA remains, however. The Thargoids. Society. The INRA discovered that Thargoid society is organized into hives, with most Thargoids falling into three categories, queens, princesses, and drones. Queens function as reproducers, while drones serve to maintain a favorable environment for the rest of the hive. Thargoid hives can be vast, although it may be that some of the larger observed groups are in fact multiple overlapping hives. Ultimately, little is known for sure. The average Thargoid queen is at least as intelligent as a human being, while the typical drone possesses a more rudimentary level of intelligence. Existing evidence suggests that queens have extremely long lifespans, living for hundreds or even thousands of years. The variable size of queens' neurocraniums suggests this might be an indicator of age. Little is known about the precise nature of Thargoid reproduction, but it is likely that queens can reproduce both sexually, with other queens, and asexually. It is thought that the latter method produces drones, while the former produces a new queen. Analysis of Thargoid specimens led some INRA researchers to believe that a new queen, or princess, becomes a full queen only once it has produced drones of its own. Significantly, queens are believed to be single sex. The Thargoid's ability to reproduce asexually means that their populations can expand incredibly quickly, but it is thought that they deliberately restrict the size of the populace so as to not to deplete all available resources. There is evidence to suggest that this is sometimes achieved by culling older drones. INRA testing indicated that queens perceive drones as entirely expendable, presumably due to the ease with which they can be replaced. 
Indeed, a Thargoid queen appears to give no more thought to the loss of a drone than a human would an eyelash. The Thargoids. Communication. The belief that Thargoids were capable of some form of extrasensory communication was often cited in the early years of human-Thargoid interaction. But prior to the discovery of INRA records, it was not fully understood. Professor Yuri Anslow of the INRA theorized that a Thargoid queen can communicate with the drones in its hive via a spread-spectrum electronic signal and can use this signal to control the drones and even to share their sensory input. Studies of battlefield footage certainly suggest some kind of near-instantaneous communication among Thargoids, and the presence of low-level radio noise in areas occupied by Thargoids indicates that they do indeed communicate via short-range electronic signals. Professor Anslow went on to claim that a queen could effectively see and hear through its drones, but her contemporaries were skeptical, dismissing the assertion as baseless. Professor Ishmael Palin, one of the galaxy's foremost experts on the Thargoids, has even gone so far as to denounce Anslow as a glory hound. Thargoids have been known to make staccato clicking noises with their mouthparts when in the presence of humans, punctuated with occasional hisses and buzzes. They've also been observed directing such noises at one another, albeit much less frequently. Professor Alba Tesro, a founding member of the Joint Superpower Initiative, Aegis, and a specialist in interspecies communication, has studied INRA audio logs and suggested that the sounds probably represent some kind of language due to the repetition of certain sound combinations. It is unclear why the Thargoids would sometimes choose to communicate with each other vocally, given their capacity for extrasensory communication. Professor Anslow suggested that the sounds could be designed to intimidate enemies or opponents, noting that Thargoids often produce them prior to combat. Thargoid ships have been observed emitting a complex array of sounds, and in some cases subtly changing color. The exact meaning of these behaviors has not been determined, but they appear to correspond to different emotional states. What is not known is if these sounds are produced by the pilot and amplified by the ship, or emitted by the ship itself. If the sounds originate with the pilot, it would suggest some kind of physiological connection between pilot and vessel. Given the sophistication of Thargoid bioengineering, however, it is possible that the sounds come from the ship itself, and that Thargoid ships are able to feel and communicate to a limited degree. The hulls of Thargoid ships are typically emblazoned with one of several symbols, the meaning of which is unknown. Some have theorized that they could denote membership of a particular familial group, or possibly be an indicator of rank. The Thargoids. Physiology. Human understanding of Thargoid physiology is far from complete, but recovered INRA data has offered some insights into their nature. INRA records describe the average Thargoid as physically larger than a human being, and generally insectoid in appearance. Thargoid biology is carbon-based, using an RNA-like encoding, but Thargoid chemistry is based on ammonia rather than water. Consequently, while Thargoids can comfortably tolerate environments as cold as minus 80 degrees Celsius, they cannot withstand environments warmer than 45 degrees Celsius for long. According to notes compiled by Dr. Peregrine Hennig, an INRA researcher, Thargoids can survive for a significant time in the vacuum of space without apparent discomfort and can tolerate radiation and extreme cold for far longer than a human. The Thargoids. Vulnerabilities. In 3250, the INRA developed a biological weapon known as the mycoid virus for use against the Thargoids. The virus was the result of an accidental discovery made by an INRA researcher who noted that a particular strain of fungus was found to thrive on the hulls of Thargoid vessels and appeared to be digesting the material of which the ship was made. The INRA refined the fungal strain and began experimenting on living Thargoids in their spacecraft. The mycoid proved to have deleterious effects on both, leading to the swift elimination of the Thargoids active in human-occupied space at the time. It is widely assumed that since the last human-Thargoid conflict, the Thargoids have developed an immunity to the mycoid virus.
The Thargoids, starships. In terms of structure and function, Thargoid vessels are radically different from anything produced by humanity and are able to navigate hyperspace in ways that are not fully understood. They are also at least partly organic, meaning that they can self-repair or heal over time. Ship function in general, and this restorative ability in particular, have been shown to be dependent upon the so-called Thargoid heart, a biomechanical organ found in varying quantities in different Thargoid ships. These hearts often survive the destruction of the ship, enabling them to be salvaged, although they can also be targeted and damaged with appropriate weaponry. They are highly corrosive, however, and require special containers for safe transport. Thargoid vessels that have sustained combat damage exhibit scar-like patterns. Given that Thargoid technology is sophisticated enough for such damage to be repaired, it follows that the Thargoids might deliberately choose to preserve these scars. INRA logs document an encounter with a Thargoid mothership many times larger than other Thargoid craft, against which the Mycoid virus was successfully deployed, although no such vessels have been reported in recent times. The Thargoids Structures Dozens of planets in human-occupied space are peppered with Thargoid barnacles, biological resource extractors that convert minerals into meta-alloys, a key component in the creation of Thargoid vehicles and technology. Theories that these barnacles have been genetically engineered by the Thargoids have yet to be verified. Lano Crater, beneath which lies a series of tunnels. At the heart of this subsurface network is a device that, once activated, emits a holographic star map. The sites are patrolled by semi-sentient biomechanical entities called scavengers. The Thargoids, war with the Guardians. Archaeological roids many thousands of years ago. Logs recovered from Guardian sites indicate that the Thargoids were the aggressor in this conflict. Having seeded Guardian space with biomechanical constructs used for resource extraction long before the emergence of the Guardian civilization, the Thargoids apparently believed they were entitled to not comply. Frameship drive charging. Contested dominion of the territory. The Guardians at four, three, two, one, engage. Attempted to communicate with the Thargoids and reach a compromise but without success. Over the course of the conflict, the Guardians developed new technologies to give them an advantage against the Thargoids. These technologies were apparently successful, forcing the Thargoids to abandon their offensive. The Thargoids. Agenda. Thargoids do not attack indiscriminately, and their choice of targets shows them to be highly intelligent. They have also conducted targeted strikes on Aegis facilities and attacked pilots carrying Thargoid items in their cargo holds, indicating that they know they are being studied and want to halt the process. But despite their evident intelligence, they appear to be completely uninterested in meaningful communication. The engineer Ram Tar, who has extensively researched the Guardians and their war with the Thargoids, holds the view that Thargoid aggression is a product of territorialism. They seed an area with barnacles, thus laying claim to it, and return, sometimes many centuries later, to harvest the extracted resources. Any life form advanced enough to compete with them for the territory is treated as an enemy and summarily attacked. Professor Palin concurs with this view, adding that the Thargoids are apparently so determined to eliminate any threats to their long-term survival, they will not tolerate any advanced species in close proximity. The Guardians. Introduction. The Guardians were a non-human race that occupied a large area of space several million years ago. At its height, the Guardian civilization was technologically superior to human civilization of the 33rd century and occupied an area of roughly equivalent size. The Guardians endured as a spacefaring civilization for at least 8,000 years before being destabilized by a lengthy civil war. The surviving Guardians were then destroyed by artificially intelligent machines of their own creation. The galaxy contains the ruins of dozens of Guardian settlements, and data logs recovered from these sites have allowed humanity to compile a remarkably detailed picture of Guardian society. 
The Guardians. Early history. The Guardian Society originally consisted of groups of pack hunters who banded together for mutual protection before organizing themselves into clans. Even at this stage, the Guardians were highly intelligent. Scan detected. And they developed sophisticated hunting strategies that quickly saw them become their planet's apex predator. The Guardian's nascent civilization consisted of two discrete ethnic groups, one based primarily in the south of the planet and one in the north. As these groups expanded, they began to encroach on each other's territory, leading to a conflict that quickly blossomed into civil war. The northern clan, despite being the smaller of the two groups, overcame their enemy swiftly and with minimal bloodshed, bringing the entirety of the Guardian civilization under their leadership. In the centuries that followed, the Guardian society developed rapidly. Despite their warlike instincts, the Guardians possessed a remarkable capacity for collaboration and compromise. Their willingness to defer immediate gains in favor of lasting societal benefits allowed them to establish a stable, mutually cooperative society that was to remain peaceful and prosperous for thousands of years. The Guardians. Technological Era. Although the Guardian society was in many ways a model of social equilibrium, the Guardians were nevertheless at the mercy of an insidious issue, overpopulation. As their civilization grew and the amount of available land and resources dwindled, the Guardians set their sights on interplanetary colonization. By this time, the Guardians had developed a rudimentary form of space travel, but as the pressures of overpopulation became more acute, the rate of technological progress accelerated, and the Guardians' imperfect starships were soon supplanted by fast, powerful spacefaring vessels. In the centuries that followed, the Guardian civilization expanded rapidly, eventually coming to occupy a region equal to that inhabited by present-day humanity. The Guardians' next major development was the creation of an interstellar communication system known as the Monolith Network. In addition to functioning as a comprehensive cultural archive, the network allowed those connected to it to freely and instantaneously share knowledge and ideas. But connection to the network was dependent on the use of neural implants, and some of the Guardians were uneasy about this fusion of biological and non-biological. The Guardians. War with the Thargoids. Tens of thousands of years earlier, when the Guardians were still a non-spacefaring race, a group of Thargoids entered what would later become Guardian space, looking for new systems to colonize. In addition to earmarking several systems containing ammonia worlds, they prepared a number of planets for occupation by seeding them with barnacles. These genetically modified constructs were designed to extract resources from a planet and transform them into resources more useful to the Thargoids. For the Thargoids, Seeding a planet with barnacles was an important step in preparing an area for occupation. The Thargoids did not return to these systems for thousands of years, and when they did, they discovered that a new race had occupied them, the Guardians. The Thargoids promptly attacked due to their innate territorialism. The Guardians responded with a partial retreat, but they also started trying to find ways to communicate with the Thargoids, hoping to determine the cause of their aggression, and perhaps negotiate a truce. After considerable effort, they succeeded in acquiring sufficient understanding of the Thargoids' language to determine the invader's agenda. But they were unable to convince the Thargoids they bore them no ill will, and the Thargoids were unshakable in their belief that they must repel any race that posed a potential threat. The Guardians were left with no choice but to defend themselves militarily. At first, they deployed soldiers, but they quickly realized that drones and other mechanized defenses would be more effective against such a physically formidable enemy. Within a relatively short period of time, the Guardian's war machines became highly sophisticated, able to recognize Thargoid engineering and to operate entirely independently. Similarly, the Thargoid's biomechanical technology was engineered to identify anything of Guardian origin. To this day, many millions of years after the Guardians disappeared, Guardian artifacts are still able to recognize Thargoid technology. And Thargoid technology still reacts negatively to the presence of Guardian artifacts. The Guardians' war machines felt no fear, fatigue or uncertainty. 
The Thargoids, meanwhile, had entered Guardian space unprepared for a protracted military campaign, and ultimately, they were forced to retreat. For the Guardians, this was cause for celebration, but many still harbored doubts about the rapid rate of technological progress, doubts that the development of sophisticated military hardware had done nothing to alleviate. The Guardians, final era. For decades, the Guardians have been experimenting with artificial intelligence. But the creation of the monolith network and the knowledge sharing it facilitated dramatically accelerated the rate of progress. Soon, the Guardians' experiments bore fruit, resulting in the first fully sentient machines. These constructs were seen as a means to further enhance the Guardians' technological mastery and were integrated into various aspects of their society. New neural implants were developed that connected the Guardians with both the constructs and the monolith network in a symbiotic circle. But not everyone was happy with this development. The Guardians had always venerated nature, and many saw this new paradigm as a perversion of the natural order. A schism emerged between the nature-worshipping traditionalists and the technologically-minded progressives, a schism that widened with alarming speed. Efforts were made to defuse the rising tension, but the traditionalists felt irrevocably alienated by the rapid rate of change. The constructs and the monolith network became scapegoats for all manner of social ills, and the traditionalists began to clamor for a return to simpler times. Ultimately, the ideological divergence proved insurmountable, and a second civil war erupted, quickly engulfing most of the Guardian star systems. In its early stages, the war was fought primarily by soldiers, but within a decade, and after a significant loss of life, most of the fighting was conducted remotely. The progressives fought their enemies with automated war machines, while the traditionalists relied mostly on biological weapons. The internecine conflict raged for over 100 years, bringing the Guardian civilization to its knees and retarding further social development. The increasingly zealous traditionalists devoted most of their resources to honoring the dead, exacerbating the problem. As the Guardian society declined, most withdrew into fortified settlements. Meanwhile, the artificially intelligent constructs were horrified by the destruction unfolding around them. Extrapolating from the current situation, they determined that even if peace was restored, the Guardians would never be able to transcend their violent natures. They decided that the only way to preclude further violence, while giving the Constructs burgeoning society the best possible chance of survival, was to destroy what remained of the Guardian civilization. By this time, the Constructs had been given complete control of the Guardian's munitions and automated war machines. Their attack, when it came, was swift and merciless. The strikes were executed with a precision that only a machine race could accomplish. The Guardians were utterly destroyed. The Guardians. Physiology. The Guardians were a bipedal race, and the typical Guardian was taller and more slender than the average human. They had small round eyes, a vestigial nose, and four digits on each hand. Their vision was superior to that of humans, while their sense of smell was poorer. Their senses of hearing and touch were roughly equivalent to our own. The Guardians had pinkish-red skin, but there was some variation among ethnic groups, with tones ranging from pale pink to deep crimson. They also had serrated bony ridges on the outside of their forearms, which were used as weapons during their early history, when they were still semi-primitive pack hunters. The Guardians' environmental needs were broadly similar to those of humans. Their homeworld was warmer and had lower gravity than most Earth-like worlds. And when they began to colonize other planets, they typically favored ones that shared these qualities. The Guardians had two genders and reproduced sexually. Procreation was a matter of personal choice, but each individual was obligated to be a parent at least once in their life to ensure the continuation of their genetic line. The average gestation period was around 300 days, and infants were effectively helpless for a period after birth, much like human young. Infants were raised in communal crashes, rather than by their parents, in keeping with the collaborative philosophies that underpinned Guardian society. The Guardians Society 
The Guardian programming limpet drone. Social constructs were the key not only to their rapid development, but also to the stability that defined the halcyon days of their civilization. Although the Guardians had a natural tendency towards collaboration, it was not until the end of the First Civil War that this tendency had a measurable programming limpet drone impact on their society. The social reorganization that followed the war included the career prospect limpet engaged of statutes that defined not only individuals' rights scan complete. Detonation but also their initiated. responsibilities to each other. As the Guardian society developed, further laws were passed that required individuals to participate in socially progressive activities, from caring for the young to conducting scientific research. These responsibilities were supported by the state, which made education and information freely available to all. For most of their history, the Guardians had no formal faith, but the creation of the monolith network precipitated the emergence of a nature religion that decried the veneration of technology. Although this religion had its roots in the Guardians' long-standing reverence for the natural world, it quickly became a radical movement, violently opposed to the use of neural implants and other advanced technologies. Ultimately, however, this new religion was to endure for only a short period. Its existence cut short by the destruction of the seismic charge disarmed Guardian Society. The Guardians. Technology. The Guardians' pre-industrial history was in many ways similar to that of the human race, with the development of tools and agriculture proving central to their development. But one respect in which they differed was in their understanding of biological engineering. The practice of selective breeding in order to eliminate or promote certain genetic traits began before the First Civil War. And as the Guardian Society progressed, their skill as genetic engineers developed in step. After the war, the Guardians developed the ability to enhance their immune systems to guard against infection and engineered specific micro detonation in 10 seconds. Organisms. biological threats. Genetic manipulation also played a part in prenatal care, which involved the removal of hereditary diseases and other undesirable conditions prior to birth. The Guardians were an ecologically conscientious people who assiduously avoided the use of rockets and fossil fuels. Their first spacecraft lacked any form of internal propulsion and were fired into space with electromagnetic launchers. Pilots and passengers were cocooned inside bubbles of breathable gel, which protected them from G-forces of launch and doubled as hibernation pods during long journeys. When it came to warfare, the Guardians relied initially on the blade-like protrusions on their forearms, and later on simple weapons like spears and bows. As they entered the technological era, they developed electromagnetic projectile weapons, utilizing the same technology they used to launch their first spacecraft. They also developed extremely effective shields, capable of protecting entire cities, and even of withstanding orbital bombardment. At that time, however, large-scale conflict was virtually unheard of, and it was not until the conflict with the Thargoids that further military innovations were made. The Guardian's Second Civil War was fought principally with bespoke biological weapons employed by the traditionalists and automated war machines used by the progressives. The shields that protected the Guardian cities were unable to resist these new weapons, forcing many of the Guardians to withdraw into heavily fortified settlements. But the Guardians' most significant technological achievements were unarguably the creation of the monolith network and the development of artificial intelligence. The use of neural implants to connect the Guardians with their creations could have ushered in a whole new era of scientific and technological discovery, but unfortunately, these innovations were to programming limpet drone. lead only to the Guardian's programming limpet drone. Destruction. Deployed. The Guardians. Language. The Guardians shared a single language with only minor regional variations. And even after they colonized other planets, they continued to share a common tongue. The Guardians had three primary forms of communication. A spoken language. Collector limpet expired. 
gestural language and a written language. Their spoken language emerged first, followed by a gestural language Programming limpet drone. that allowed them to communicate silently while hunting. This Programming limpet drone. sign language formed the basis of their written language. Consequently, Programming limpet drone. while their written and gestural languages correlated closely, their spoken language limpet expired. was largely distinct. The Guardian's spoken language was used principally Programming limpet drone to communicate emotional concepts and played a central role in social bonding, while their written language was used mainly to communicate formal and practical ideas. Significantly, their written language was logographic, meaning the programming limpet drone. words and phrases were represented by single characters. The Guardians Human Guardian Contact In 3301, Presidential vessel, Starship One, suffered catastrophic dry failure during a tour of frontier systems, resulting in the ship's destruction. Jasmina Halsey, at that time the federal president, was left drifting in an escape pod, unconscious. During this period of stasis, Halsey believed she was visited by transdimensional beings of extraordinary intelligence and compassion. Later, when she was rescued and revived, she was left with the conviction that this experience had been real, and not merely a hallucination. Halsey proceeded to experience visions of mysterious alien worlds and cities, dense metropolises full of activity and life. She shared these visions with the rest of humanity, prompting explorers to set off in search of these undiscovered planets. This led to the discovery of the first Guardian ruins in the Sinuev XRH D11102 system, the fact that these sites were devoid of life led to speculation that Halsey had seen the Guardian worlds not as they are, but as they had been. In the months that followed, several further sites were found. The engineer Ram Tar started researching the Guardians, and eventually succeeded in developing a decryption algorithm that could decode Guardian data, leading to a much deeper understanding of their lost civilization. Since then, other engineers have leveraged Ramtar's discoveries to develop Guardian human technology. The Dark Wheel Oh, they're out there, all right. I've never met them, but I know they're out there. Think about how well-known the stories are. Now think about how easy it would be for some two-bit... And of hucksters to pass themselves off as the the Federation the Federation introduction for I dipped into the future far as human eye could see saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be saw the heavens fill with commerce argosies of magic sails pilots of the purple twilight dropping down with costly bales till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man the federation of the world alfred lord tennyson loxley hall 1835 how then to attempt the impossible task of summing up the federation we are the ones who draw the lines our forefathers, who lived through the bitter anguish of global wars, drew a line under them and declared, 
No more. We enshrine the right Contested. of all citizens in our Constitution, underlined them, and signed. We plotted the lines that first linked the star systems, bringing humanity to the shores of new worlds, opening the way to interstellar trade. And when humanity itself, in the exuberance of youth, threatened the delicate balance of alien life, again we drew a line. Thus far let us lawfully tread, and no further. Isaac Gellin, Federation President, Inaugural Speech, 2862. The Federation is the oldest of the galaxy's three superpowers, a vast geopolitical entity reaching out from the core system of Sol and encompassing a broad socio-economic spectrum. Among the myriad federal star systems, one can find extraordinary wealth, crushing poverty, and everything in between. By contrast with the Empire, which offers a social safety net in the form of state-sanctioned slavery, the poorest members of federal society have no safeguards and no way out. For them, life on the graffiti-stained streets is inescapable, and the gulf between their lives and those of the super-rich could not be more insurmountable. At its best, the Federation embodies the values of its founding nations, democracy, industry, and liberty. But Programming limpet drone. Federal society can also be competitive and unforgiving. Corporations wield Prospect Olympic engaged. too much power. Politicians are often corrupt. Asteroid scan complete. And a sink or swim ethos prevails. Detonation sequence initiated. The Federation. History. The nations of Earth united in the aftermath of war. After the devastation of World War III, the United States of the Americas rose to become the planet's dominant nation. Over the following years, it gradually brought the other nations of the world under its aegis. Called at first the Federation of the USA, the expanding democracy was soon given the less exclusive title of the Collect expired. Federation. Humanity reached for the stars. When faster-than-light travel became a reality in the 22nd century, several terrestrial corporations competed fiercely to establish the first human colony in a new expired. star system. Tau Ceti was the first system to be colonized, followed by Delta Pavonis, Beta Hydria, and Altair. In their wake, there followed a wild scramble of pioneering expeditions and colonial ventures. The first colony rebelled. The year 2161 saw a dispute between the colony of Tau Ceti III and the Federation Authority, centered on the colonists' repeated refusal to limit the damage they were inflicting on the alien ecosystem. Earth dispatched a fleet with orders to revoke the colony's charter. The colony responded by declaring independence. A military stalemate led to grudging compromise, and the Federal Accord resulted, granting the system rights and representation, along with concomitant duties. The Federation, born on Earth, was now an association of star systems. The birthright wars Detonation in 10 seconds. gave corporations preferential treatment. Starting in 2621, a group of corporations subjected the federal government to over a century of unrelenting pressure. They demanded the right to buy up underexploited colonial land from its hereditary owners. Under the terms of the original charters, the land belonged to the colonists and their descendants, regardless of their ability to mine, farm, or otherwise exploit it, meaning that immense resources were lying untapped. The corporations argued that with the machinery, workforce and fleets at their disposal, they could tap those resources, the Federation would be enriched, the original owners would be compensated, and everyone would be satisfied. The Federation bowed to pressure and allowed compulsory purchase of the family's land, albeit for far less than the expected sums. Outrage, rebellion, 
and in one case, the defiant resettlement of an entire colony resulted. The Federation's detractors often point to this dark episode as indicative of its true nature, a mere administrative puppet bent to the will of rapacious corporations. The Federation. Society. A federated democracy. The Federation's legislative body is made up of congressmen elected to represent their system or state. Apart from the oldest core system, such as Sol, which encompasses multiple states, each star system within the Federation is considered a single state. New colonies do not qualify for full Federation membership until and unless they fulfill the development objectives set down for them. With self-reliance comes representation. The federal government has its seat on Mars, which was terraformed in 2286. Congress was moved there from Earth in the early third millennium. The executive branch is headed by an elected president with a fixed eight-year term. Cargo scoop deployed. Constitutional rights obtain. The sovereign rights of all individuals are enshrined in the Constitution, which is a modified and streamlined version of the US Constitution, originally programming limpet drone. codified in the 18th century. The right to liberty underscores the absolute ban on slavery within the Federation and is a point of contention with the Empire. Corporate interests dominate. Collector limpet expired. Although the Federation is loud programming limpet drone and proudly democratic, corporations still exercise tremendous influence over the democratic process, shaping citizens' choices through celebrity endorsement, lobbying, and occasionally outright corruption. The government is notoriously reluctant to curb corporate activity. The typical question in Congress is not whether a given policy will favor corporate interests, but which ones it will favor. Competition between corporations for Congress support can lead to a deadlock in the government. The Federation. Military. The Federal Navy. The Federation has maintained a battle fleet since the days of the first Federal colony, which was established in the Tau Ceti system. Its official mandate is to protect shipping and defend the borders of Federal space, but it has also frequently been deployed against the Federation's own rebellious citizens. At first, the Federation's member systems were required to contribute to the required ships, making the mustering process a cumbersome one. But following the birthright wars, corporations were chartered to produce centralized fleets, which made for a far more efficient system. The Naval Shipyards and Training Academy were originally based in the Anlave system, but the Academy has since been moved to the custom world of Navy Central, in Eta Cassiopeia. The Navy benefited from massive investment following the forced sell-off of colonial land in the Birthright Wars, during which it was wielded against the colonists in a bitterly resented move. When the Thargoids were first encountered in 2849, the Navy was boosted once again in fear of the alien threat, and a further bolstering followed in 2867, in the aftermath of what were believed to be Thargoid attacks. Governor Raul Santorini championed heavy cuts to the Navy budget in 3022, which were not reversed until President Varian Scott came to power in 3144. Scott talked up the Thargoid threat, again increasing funding to the Navy and removing the requirement for military actions to be approved by congressional vote. Land Forces In addition to the rank and file, the Federation still enjoys the loyal service of special military divisions, such as the Gurkha Regiment, who have served since the days of Earth. Keeping up long-standing traditions such as this is an important link to the past for federal citizens. The Federation. Culture and values. If you want to eat, Cargo scoop retracted. you have to work. The Federation has no room for freeloaders. It is nurtured. Objective detected. The core frontier values of self-reliance and entrepreneurship since its inception and respects the self-made citizen. 
This insistence upon paying your way and pulling your weight also applied, notoriously, to the process whereby new colonies were established. Until a given colony was able to fulfill the development goals set down for it by the Federation, it could only ever be a dependency with no voice of its own. Given that the Federation's assigned goals could vary wildly from one colony to the next, this requirement frequently chafed with the colonists. While the Federation maintained that it was simply exercising flexibility, since no two worlds were the same, some colonies were tempted away to the Empire by the promise of being recognized as sovereign without having to jump through arbitrary hoops. Corporations took humanity into space. The Federation has never forgotten the role played by private enterprise in the initial migration from Earth. Corporations enjoy substantial freedom and influence under the Federation, so much so that it often seems they are the powers truly running the show. Federal citizens can be as passionately loyal to their corporations as they would be to a family or clan group, and it is common for successive generations of a given family to serve the same corporation. Harvest the limitless riches of space, but respect non-human life. The Federation and the Empire have hugely differing views on the primacy of humanity in the cosmos. While the Federation insists that its colonies treat indigenous non-human life with care, the Empire typically takes a more human-centric approach. This attitude has allowed the Empire to poach several developing Federation colonies who felt themselves hamstrung by ecological regulations. Wealth is freedom. Federal citizens actively embrace corporate culture, expressing their identity through brand choices and media consumption. The Federation. Diplomatic relations. The Empire. In 2292, a group of colonists established a settlement on Achenar 6D, chosen for its remoteness. The original intent was merely to live free from interference, but autocrat Henson Duval rapidly took control of the colony and had himself proclaimed emperor. The Federation attempted military reprisals, partly due to the nascent empire's insistence on independence, but faced a harder fight than they had expected and were held at bay. Over the next 50 years, the empire expanded to many other worlds. The Federation's relationship with the Empire is one of entrenched mistrust, stemming from irreconcilable ideological differences, mollified somewhat by the corporations, which have a presence in both territories, and thus act as a stabilizing influence. Outright hostilities between the powers, when they occur at all, are usually conducted through proxy forces. The Alliance in 3228, the federally aligned corporations supplying the Alioth system attempted to raise their prices, leading to a citizen rebellion. Several independent systems assisted the rebels. Neither galactic superpower was able to suppress the revolt. The Empire was too far away to intervene effectively, whereas the Federation was hampered by unexpected public sympathy for the rebels. The Alliance of Independent Systems, founded on Alioth in 3230, drew in new members over the next 20 years. Some were already independent, while others defected from the Federation or Empire. In order to keep more worlds from defecting, expired. the Federation was forced to reform the process whereby colonies could achieve full federal membership. So far, it has only managed to slow the loss of worlds to the Alliance and has yet to tempt any back. The Empire. Introduction. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculty. In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world. The paragon of animals. Shakespeare, Hamlet. When our ancestors departed Earth, they asked themselves, which of our achievements represents the best of humanity that we may bring it with us to illumine the darkness? 
the Federation, embroiled in a world of contracts and petty bickering, chose their constitution. They placed their trust not in man himself, but in an imperfect work of man. But my ancestor, your first emperor, was wiser. He knew that the best achievement of humanity was humanity itself. <laughs> there was more wisdom in a single nucleotide of his noble DNA than in all the Federation's written texts. That same wisdom still guides us now. We need no dusty documents to assert our right. We are human born to rule. And the universe awaits the firm hand of our governance. Emperor Trascan Duval II, undelivered draft speech written immediately before his sudden and unexplained death. The Empire, while younger than the Federation, is easily the equal of its historic rival in terms of scale and resources. The key social distinction between the two powers is that slavery in the Empire is legal, a fact that has remained a source of controversy since its inception, both within the Empire and without. Some observers have pointed out, however, that conditions for those at the lowest levels of federal society are far worse than those experienced by imperial slaves. The popular image of the empire is one of opulence, but while pomp and pageantry may be the norm in the core imperial systems, elsewhere in imperial space, one can find myriad examples of deprivation and squalor. Indeed, the empire encompasses many striking contrasts. Sophisticated technology exists alongside an ancient Roman system of government, and the affluence of the core worlds depends on often unregulated slave labor in the wretched outer colonies. Ruthless industrial efficiency and low taxation has made the empire rich and mighty. The hierarchy of imperial society is rigid, but a citizen can always rise through the ranks if he or she becomes wealthy enough and makes the right connections. Even a slave could, in theory, become a senator. The Empire. History. The Akinar colony was founded. In the mid-23rd century, wealthy entrepreneur Marlin Duval was so frustrated with the federal government that she founded an independent colony of her own in the Akinar system, chosen for its remoteness. When Marlin was killed shortly afterwards in a flyer accident, her brother Henson Duval took over as ruler. Henson Duval the Emperor. Duval immediately abolished the fledgling democracy that Marlin had set up and in its place, he established a system modeled on ancient Rome. He was now emperor, and his closest allies were his senators. Any colonists who might have objected were forced into silent compliance with Duval's vision. Such were his wealth and power. It was also widely believed that Marlin Duval, like Remus in ancient Rome, had been killed by her own brother. Nobody dared to speak out. The Mudlark Extinction the colonists were aware that the planet they had settled, Akinar 6D, had indigenous life. But at first, it wasn't appreciated that this included a sentient species, nicknamed the mudlarks after they were observed digging through riverbank mud in search of food. Although the mudlarks were at a pre-agricultural stage of development, they appeared to have developed the beginnings of language. They also created crude forms in molded clay with no obvious practical purpose, possibly indicating a nascent artistic culture. The mudlarks proved fatally vulnerable to the bacteria carried by the colonists, and within a few decades of the colony's founding, the species was extinct. Rumors subsequently emerged that Henson Duval had purposefully removed all traces of the mudlarks, partly in fear of federal reprisal, and partly to ensure that his development plans would not be hindered by ecological constraints. The Federation attempted to reclaim Akinar. When the federal government heard rumors that Duval's colony had recklessly caused the destruction of a sentient indigenous species, they decided on military intervention. The Imperial ships beat back the federal attackers, 
who were unable to establish a beachhead among the airless outer worlds and struggled to maintain supply lines so far from Earth. The Federal forces eventually fell back and entrenched in the Beta Hydri system. Skirmishes with Imperial ships continued for the next 50 years, but these were unable to prevent Duval from expanding the Empire to many other worlds. The Age of Expansion After hostilities with the Federation ceased, the Empire entered a century of growth, annexing many new systems and persuading others to join it spent the following two centuries consolidating its new territory, appointing colonial administrators from among the noble houses of Achenar. The Empire. Society. An ancient Roman model. The Empire works on a clean system. Society is divided into tiers. Emperor, senators, patrons, clients, and then citizens, with slaves below these. Groups of patrons pledge their support to a given senator, offering military service, tax revenue, and the right to wield the patrons' votes in the Senate on their behalf. In return, the patrons are granted a measure of protection and material security, as well as having their interests represented in the Imperial Senate. Senators are responsible for deciding tax rates and welfare systems for their patrons meaning that the lower a given senator's tax rates, the more patrons he is likely to attract. This is far from being a patron's only concern, however. Loyalty over time, ideological compatibility, family connections, and discreet private deals can all play a part in deciding which senator to back. The system extends downward through the tiers in a similar fashion, with clients pledging themselves to given patrons, and citizens pledging themselves to given clients. The votes held by the patrons actually comprise the total votes of all the clients pledged to them. Similarly, the votes held by those clients comprise the total votes of their pledged citizens. Patrons are therefore capable of investing variable degrees of power in their chosen senators, with the result that some senators are more powerful than others. Senators are responsible for those below them meaning that everyone has a form of social security, at least in theory. Indeed, many senators take pride in the security they offer their citizens. Some have even been known to drain material wealth from small independent worlds and pump it back into the capital economy, allowing them to reduce citizens' taxes and giving their own popularity a considerable boost. Patrons are free to withdraw their patronage from their chosen senators personally, with little, if any, fear of consequence. The Empire. Military. The Imperial Navy. Maintaining a modernized navy has always been a top priority for the Empire. The ever-present threat posed by the Federation has driven previous emperors to empty the coffers again and again, for fear of being outstripped in the arms race. More recently, funding has come from wealthy individual senators, many of whom are all too eager to gain influence within the Navy. Indeed, it has been claimed that devastating planetary mining has been carried out in order to further this cause. The Fasisi system is arguably the most significant Imperial naval base. Many officers are housed on the world of Topaz, while Peter's Wreck is home to the training centers. As well as the battle fleets, the Imperial Navy maintains a subdivision dedicated to exploring the fringes of known space. The Emperor's Own Genetic engineering is not officially tolerated in the Empire, but it does sometimes take place. One notable example is the Emperor's Own, a group of genetically engineered super soldiers deployed during the shock invasion of Mansfield Colony in the Leadler system in 2959. They proved brutally efficient, overrunning the federal defenses in a mere two hours and inflicting a rare defeat upon a federal Gurkha regiment. The Empire, Culture and Values. The human body represents perfection. This belief, once held with near religious intensity, still forms the bedrock of the Empire's culture and morals. Genetic modification is frowned upon but a degree of genetic correction is known to take place, supposedly to correct defects such as vulnerability to certain diseases. 
The belief in the sanctity of the human body originates with the first emperor, Henson Duval. While he did not claim to be literally descended from the gods in the manner of Roman emperors of old, he declared that his own image was the paradigm to which others ought to aspire. Households across the empire were required to display a statue or bust of the emperor in a place of honor. Imperial citizens are therefore expected to shun habits that corrupt or defile the human body, such as excessive indulgence in narcotics. The ownership of slaves, by contrast, is tolerated in the same way that the ownership of any beautiful work of art is tolerated. Mistreatment of slaves is thus akin to vandalism. Keeping one's own body in peak condition and adorning it with jewels and expensive clothes is not vanity, but duty. And owning well-treated slaves is also considered a sign of good character. The emperor's word is supreme. The emperor's successor is decided by the Senate, although the Duval dynasty has such a strong power base that the imperial throne has only ever been occupied by members of that bloodline. For generations, genetic selection ensured that the emperor's heir would be male, and the current ruler, Arissa Lavinie Duval, is the first woman to hold the throne. Marlin Duval is sometimes described as the empire's first female ruler, but this is incorrect. The colony she founded was a democracy. Honor is everything. The value placed on honor is a constant throughout all tiers of imperial society. Honor can be lost through various means, including leaving debts unpaid, failing to respect a superior or provide for a dependent, breaking a solemn vow, conducting combat with cowardly weapons such as nerve gas, and defiling one's own body. Slavery is acceptable, but slaves must be well treated. In the empire, it is not uncommon for the poor and disenfranchised to sign up for a period of military service in exchange for a small sum of money. A similar logic applies to imperial slavery, to the extent that someone might sell themselves into slavery to clear a debt and restore their honor. Selling oneself into slavery is a straightforward legal process and results in a guaranteed sum of money for one's family so it is a popular option for the desperate. In practice, however, many find that it takes much longer than expected to clear their debts. People are also forced into slavery against their will. Sometimes a senator will sentence a person of lower rank to be stripped of citizenship and designated as a slave. But it is more common to impose a fine of such magnitude that the citizen has no recourse but to sell his or herself into slavery. Slaves may also be taken prisoner following a conflict, abducted from their home, or even captured in a hijacking. While trading slaves is lawful everywhere in the empire, except on Emerald, taking new slaves outside of wartime is illegal, without the blessing of a senator. The Empire. Diplomatic relations. The Federation. Resentment of the Federation runs deep in the Empire. The superpower is remembered as an oppressive, interfering force that hypocritically avoids inflicting the slightest harm on non-human life, but thinks nothing of forcibly imposing its values on its fellow humans, and lacking the freedoms and social customs that the Empire values so dearly. While open hostility has frequently been the case in the past, the current situation is one of grudging coexistence beneath which mistrust simmers. Despite this antipathy, the Empire cooperated with the Federation in a series of joint initiatives against the Thargoids in the early 3300s. The Alliance When the Alliance was founded in 3230, following a bitter conflict with the Empire and the Federation, multiple systems defected to it from both superpowers. To the surprise of many, the Empire took very little further retributive action partly because of the ill health of the emperor of the time and partly due to a belief that the defecting systems would return to their natural home sooner or later. The empire's current attitude to the alliance is one of studied contempt. To recognize it as a threat would be too much like showing respect. Internal politics. Programming limpet drone. Unsurprisingly for a society so concerned with rank and influence, the Empire contains a multitude of feuding power blocks. 
In particular, there is a prospect limpet engaged. A deal of bad blood between the various noble houses. Asteroid scan complete. Whose values range from hardcore traditionalist to staunch reformist. Detonation sequence initiated. The Imperial Senate is no longer as overshadowed by the Emperor as it once was, and has gained sufficient strength to act as a counterbalance to the Emperor's political will. The individual character of the Emperor still determines the Empire's overall direction, however, and the suggestion that the Empire should evolve out of its old ways has proven deeply divisive. The Alliance. Introduction. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Percy by Shelley, The Mask of Anarchy, 1819. I've read your speech a dozen times, Mick. We can't use it. I'm sure we could sound off about self-rule and freedom from tyranny and the dignity of the working man slash woman. And the young hotheads would lap it up like they always do. I'm not saying we don't need that stuff. Detonation in ten seconds. But we mustn't forget it's just marketing. A shiny wrapper. It's not enough. If we're going to make the Alliance of Independent Systems happen, we need more than tub-thumping speeches from a war hero. We need to show our people that the damn thing can work. I want spending plans, dividend forecasts, surveyors reports. I want data so dry you don't need to believe in it. The people are tired and heartsick. They've been sold dreams too many times by both sides, so let's not try to sell them anymore. It's time to wake up. <laughs> Private communique from Meredith Argent to Mick Turner, founders of the Alliance. The Alliance is the youngest of the galaxy's three superpowers and is perhaps best understood in terms of what it chooses not to be. It rejects both the extreme capitalism of the Federation and the rigid hierarchy of the Empire, choosing instead a third way of voluntary association for mutual benefit. The desire for freedom from interference, both from external threats and internal bureaucracy, was the key motivation behind the Alliance's founding and is enshrined in its Articles of Association. The governments of the member systems are given as much autonomy to create their own laws and administer their own affairs as possible. The right to political self-determination and cultural self-expression are essential to the Alliance, but it remains to be seen whether the ultimate result will be stable harmony or a cacophony of dissenting voices. Every Alliance member knows that alliances have been made before, many times over, only to collapse. The Alliance. History. Alioth was colonized. The crucible in which the Alliance was forged was Alioth, a system so rich in gas and mineral resources that early surveyors considered it a stellar El Dorado. When the Federation established its first colony on Alioth 5b in 2452, they gave the planet the less grandiose name of Fruitcake as mineral deposits lay in the loamy soils as abundantly as raisins in cake. Later, commentators would reflect, bitterly, that the world was well named, because everyone wanted a peace. A conflict over mining rights drew in the superpowers. Alioth's prosperity soon attracted Practic corporations eager to support the developing system in exchange for a share of the profits. Programming limpet drone. A dispute over rights quickly escalated into an armed conflict, prompting the Empire to dispatch a military force, ostensibly for the colonists' protection. Programming limpet drone. The Federation also sent ships, but theirs were a response to the corporation's plea for aid. Unable to directly engage the Federal ships without sparking a war, the Empire covertly encouraged the Alioth colonists to renounce the Federation and accept Imperial protection, thus freeing the Empire to engage with the occupying Federal forces in sympathy with the will of the people. 
This marked the first of many incidents in which the people of Alioth were used to advance the agenda of another power. Federation Sponsored Insurrection In 2530, the Federation set out to undermine imperial control of Alioth by exploiting local resentment of the governor. They covertly supported acts of protest and petty vandalism. Then, when the inevitable imperial crackdown followed, stoked the fires of social unrest. A terrorist movement called the Cakers emerged, and the atrocities escalated. The years that followed saw a protracted and degrading series of proxy wars and cynical propaganda campaigns as the federal, imperial, and corporate powers all contended for Alioth. The system made an abortive attempt to establish its independence in 2617, resulting in a short-lived cooperation between the Empire and the Federation, neither of which were willing to allow this. The Revolution In the early 4th millennium, both the Federation and the Empire had a presence in the Alioth system. Fruitcake, now known as Gordon World, was a federal protectorate, while the Empire had earlier conducted terraforming experiments on the world of New California, and also held gas mining platforms in the system. The federal corporations supplying New California had raised the prices of their goods several times in the previous years, and when they imposed yet another price hike, the planet's inhabitants revolted. In the insurrection that followed, rebels commandeered any available ships and cargo hold at maximum capacity headed out to the gas mining platforms where they attacked the outpost's corporate employees. Alarmed, the Empire and the Federation dispatched ships to put down the rebellion, but were beaten back by a hastily assembled force made up of fighters from Alioth and, crucially, volunteers from nearby independent systems. Neither the Empire nor the Federation were able to gain a foothold, and eventually both forces had to withdraw. The Empire faced too many logistical problems fighting so far from home, while the Federation's efforts were undermined by public sympathy for the rebels. An alliance was brokered. The victory in Alioth had proven that independent systems working together could hold their own against the superpowers. It fell to pilot Mick Turner and scientist Meredith Argent to ride the wave of public spirit and propose a permanent alliance under whose aegis independent systems could enjoy freedom from imperial and federal interference. Collector limpet expired. The alliance was founded in 3230, and in the next two decades, it expanded its mem Programming limpet drone. membership to more than 20 systems, some defecting from the Federation and the Empire, others pledging as independents. The Alliance. Society. Many worlds, few rules, no overlords. The Alliance's Articles of Membership